<laughs> Good evening, everybody, and welcome back to our Saturday night, I mean, Sunday night, Sunday. Steve and friends. I'm going to bring up my friends in a moment for now. I'm just saying, Woo, nope, they're not up there with me. But uh, we're going to continue our study of practical Christianity and rightly dividing the battle. Uh, so I'm going to bring up the usual suspects here. We got up there in my upper right-hand corner. I'm not sure what it looks like to you guys down there. But in the upper right-hand corner, we got this guy. Uh, what's his name? It's uh, that guy right there rubbing his hands together. He can't wait to get a word in edgewise. What's his name again? Ricky Usler. You are so helpful, <laughs> Phil. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Yeah, that's what I, I appreciate right that. There, that guy down there at the bottom right. Yeah, he probably belongs a little deeper than that, but he's at the bottom right right now. He's uh, That's Phil Walthall. Who's that hairy guy over there next to you, Phil? Scott. That is Scott Stevens. Scott Stevens. All right. I have to identify. I, 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 you know, I... The, the cube thing there, the old game show, right? The, oh, yeah. So, all right, guys. So, well, here, here we go. I wanted to uh, throw something out there for folks who were trying to keep these things where the sequence as you watch them that'll actually be helpful to you. So the last two weeks, we've been going through rightly dividing the battle. We went through Romans 13 and the higher powers there two weeks ago. Um, we also then went through about how Israel in their rebellion to God when they were under the judges before they had a civil government, they didn't have any civil government They because Christ was their king how in their rebellion to Christ and rejection of him as a king, how Sam, they came and asked Samuel for a king, and he went to the Lord about it because he wasn't pleased with this. And when he went to the Lord about it, the Lord told him, look, it's not you they've rejected, it's me they've rejected. But I want you to hearken unto them and to give them the king that they have asked for. And he went through and he made, he said, but do solemnly protest and tell them what manner of king they shall have. And essentially, the king that he describes, essentially describes civil governments the world over. Okay? And they are not of God. And what you had happen after that, after they got their king is, and this is where we left off last week, is we were over in... First uh, Samuel chapter 12, and we went through. Now, what had happened is Samuel had anointed, Samuel as the higher power, had anointed Saul to be king over Israel. And Saul was that king that was described, where it was basically going to be all about him. He was going to take, you know, he was going to tax them. He's going to take their best lands. He's going to take their best men. He's going to take their best women. He was going to take all of these things for himself and his servants. That's what he was going to do. And uh, so what happened is we then go forward. And as he goes to confirm the kingdom after he had anointed Saul over in First Samuel chapter 12, and we read the first uh, 15 verses last week, it ended with these two verses in 14 and 15. He said, if ye will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice. Now, this is spoken to the people. This is saying, if the people of Israel will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall both ye and also the king that reigneth over you continue following the Lord your God. But if ye will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall the hand of the Lord be against you as it was against your fathers. So, it is from this passage that you'll hear us uh, sometimes talk about how God gives us leaders after our own heart. Now, this was in a kingdom. They didn't have any vote over who was going to be king in Israel. This was in a kingdom. But basically, the promise of God was is that if the people, and these are the people who called themselves by his name, this was essentially his church, if you want to think of it, if they would fear the Lord and obey his voice and not rebel against 
his commandments, then they not only themselves would serve the Lord, but also their king would. But if they didn't, then God wouldn't be with them or with their king. All right. Now, let's pick up from there. And I want to show you how it kind of punctuates how Samuel was the higher power. And keep in mind, there's a scripture over in Hebrews where it says, without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. Right? And this is a very important point. That's why Samuel anointed Saul to be king, because Samuel was greater than Saul. Samuel was the higher power in Israel. And that's why when he then told Saul that he wasn't going to be king anymore and his kingdom wasn't going to continue, but God had a man who was after his own heart, he, he was going to anoint to be king. Then when Samuel anointed David, of course, ultimately, David was protected from Saul, even though Saul tried to kill him. David became king um, and Saul never recovered from that uh that decision he made he just never recovered and i share this because once again that confirms the truth that samuel was the higher power so let's see what samuel does which of you guys is over there in first samuel 12. i can read okay, i'm gonna let phil read go ahead phil you read from verse 16. Uh, I sure will. Uh, can I say one point on what you just said too? It, I, um, yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, it is interesting. You see Samuel's word go out and the anointing to happen. And you see that anointing and David is going to happen, even though all the things that were, <clears throat> you know, that David went through, he still became King. The word of God that came out of Saul uh, happened and there was nothing mean, out of Samuel, him. out of Samuel. Out of Samuel, yeah, forgive me. And then, and but nothing was going to stop it. Right. Um, it happened. And that point you just made is exceptionally important, Phil. Did we lose Phil? No, I'm right here. No, okay. He's here. Oh no, what it is is I'm looking at the video and there's the delay, so I thought he was still talking. I apologize. Um, but that point I want to say is very important. See, Christians all too often today think that. God's word coming to pass is dependent upon them. No, God's word's going to come to pass. It the Christians being in agreement with God's word or not is not going to change the fact that God's word is going to come to pass. It, I mean, that is the end of the story. All right, that's why we call him God. All right, is because his word is going to come to pass. And that's why the word of the prophets, because what you see is prior to the, prior to there being a king, the leaders, the leaders that God appointed were called judges. You know, Moses was a judge. Joshua was a judge. Then I think it was Caleb's son was a judge. I think his name was Othniel or something like that. Gideon was a judge. You know, you had all these people. Samuel was the last judge. And then what you had is when the kings came in, you now had prophets who were God's man who would speak unto the people, okay? And one of the reasons why that is, that a lot of people don't see, is that, see, under the law of Moses and the way that they set up the government, if you will, God's government under the law of Moses, the judge was, he was not a hereditary position. God chose whom he would, and they were like, Samson was of Dan, Gideon was of like Manasseh, um, you know, you had some who were of Judah, others who were of various different tribes. Okay, And the thing was, is that now that they had rejected God as their king, they no longer had that person fulfilling a judge because they had a king. And he was the one who would bring forth the judgment, if you remember. That's why they came to Solomon, they came to the judge. Now, the king, if he was smart, would want one of God's prophets over there helping him out. Right. Yeah, and that's how Daniel, that's how David was, for example. But um, if they didn't, God still had his prophets. And those prophets, when they spoke to those kings, what they said came to pass. Because they were over the king. All right. They were the higher power that God was using. That's why if you go over 
And my children's favorite scriptures when they were young were always those ones where the prophet was prophesying that everyone that pisseth against the wall is going to die, referring to a king and his children. Happened to Ahab, couldn't be a nicer guy. You know, he also added that Jezebel was going to be eaten by the dogs and they're going to lick up her blood and, and stuff like that. That happened too. Um, you know, each of these different things happened precisely in accordance because the prophet was the higher power of God. He was the one that God had established. The king was in rebellion to God. I'm talking about the king, his existence was in rebellion to God. Amen. The, As an office. Right. That's right. And the ex and the existence of the existence of civil government. The only reason why civil government exists is because of man's rebellion to God. It's not something that God established and ordained. But God's government in this world, so to speak, is through his body, which is the church, and it's only to the church. Good point. Yeah. It doesn't extend beyond the church. Right. Super, super important point there, Steve, because what you're seeing now is churches and the, quote, church, churchdom trying to impose God's law on those that aren't part of the church. <clears throat> yeah. And, and, and the other and the, thing you see is is <laughs> there's two different kingdoms, the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of God. And when Jesus came, he was coming in the bring in the kingdom of God. That's the kingdom he was king of. <clears throat> right. And that's the Amen. kingdom that his disciples then went forth and manifested. Some of them lost their heads like James. Some of them were stoned like Stephen. But all of them manifested the power and love of his kingdom. That's what they did. And that's what we're to do. So pick up reading then from verse 16 in 1 Samuel 12 then, Phil. Now, therefore, stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Is it not wheat harvest today? I will call unto the Lord, and he shall send thunder and rain, that you may perceive and see that your wickedness is great, which ye have done in the sight of the Lord, and asking you a king. So Samuel called unto the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day. And all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. Stop. And all the Stop right there. That watch so there's going to be a massive outpouring of grace here towards the children of israel through samuel but it could only come to pass if they actually acknowledged and repented of their error okay and so samuel in his authority as the higher power brought the Lord to bear in a manner that, remember the disciples standing in awe and wonder of Jesus stilling the storm and different things like that. Who is this man that he can even, that he can even, you know, control the winds and the rain and stuff like that. They're saying, well, I mean, it's the same God who had been there all along for them. Right? Samuel did it. You follow what I'm saying? Didn't Moses do it? I mean, with the various plagues over there in Egypt. Didn't um, uh, and each of these guys who we're talking about, of course, were the higher powers established by God, who, if you resisted them, you received damnation. OK, you could resist the king and live. All right. Certainly be, maybe he could kill you, but you didn't receive damnation for it. You resist the higher power. You received to yourself damnation. Very different experience. OK, folks. Um, and I and I say that to you because Christ didn't say that we wouldn't maybe die. He said, fear not those who can kill the body, but fear him who can cast your soul in hell. Right. Mm -hmm. So yep. what he's doing here is he's bringing this to pass and making it manifest so that the people will understand the gravity of their error. Very important. And see, Christianity has lost the importance of conviction unto repentance. Because mercy only comes with repentance. Mercy is different from grace. It's not just willy-nilly there around everybody. No, in order to obtain mercy, you have to acknowledge that you are wrong. Grace covers us when we don't even realize we're wrong. 
Okay, think of it much like a father's love for a child. The father still loves the child, and the child can come home. Father, you know, different things. There's a lot of things a father will do. It doesn't mean the father approves of what the son did. It doesn't mean that the father is ready to go and give him the keys to the kingdom, so to speak. It doesn't mean a lot of different things, but the father may have a lot of grace on his son while his son's learning about his own stupidity. Because it doesn't seem to be that we are too quick on the uptake on this lesson. You know, oh yeah, I did that wrong, but I'm still basically a good person. Hello, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, uh, no, I mean, that unfortunately is just not the case, folks. You know, there's none good. No, not one. All right. And we are totally dependent on the Lord to do any good thing. I mean, the scripture actually says all good things come down from the father of lights. So if it came down from him, in what way can we uh, take unto ourselves that we are the one who is good? You follow? And I share this because these are things that have been, to me, these bright lines that the word the Lord has seem to be have been grayed out in Christianity today. And it causes people to miss the blessings of God because there's no God loves it when somebody repents. He's not like angry at you for repenting. If he's ever frustrated with you, it's the fact that he tries to show you your need to repent and you keep rejecting it. And so he can have grace on you um, and the like, but the blessings of repentance, he can't pour out upon you. And you see this with the disciples. I mean, look at the Great Commission. Were they given the Great Commission after they had, he was coming in and applauding them and giving them a standing ovation for, for all their good works and their faithfulness? He reproved them from the hardness of their heart. Yeah, he <laughs> upbraided them. <laughs> and basically read them the riot act for I mean he had told them he had told them he had told them then they hear the women and they hear these other two guys and they still don't believe you find what I'm saying and after rebuking them then he said go ye into all the world and preach the gospel why because their repentance meant that now they were people who could actually go and preach the gospel that Jesus Christ came to save sinners of who I, the Apostle Peter, I, the Apostle John, you find him saying, am chief. I mean, I'm no better than you. Right? I mean, that's the gospel. The gospel is not about good people, get, making good people better. It's about making evil people be able to do something amazingly good because that's how big he is. But that's yeah, not that that funny. Go ahead, it's kind Phil. of funny because I, I think about Peter really grabbing hold of the gospel like very quick, really early. <laughs> he grabbed it, and you hear the testimony of Peter walking in the power and anointing of the Lord mightily after the mm -hmm. one where he was the one that caught crew three times, and or he denied him thrice and the caught crew twice. And you know, he thought he was over, it was all these things, and the Lord showed up before him, and he grabbed a hold of that gospel in a, in a real way and man the pad the shadow of peter passing by people were being healed very early on in acts he had an extraordinarily powerful ministry and the one that was you know quote, what it looked like for this the way at that point <clears throat> sure sure i go efficient you know he wasn't yeah. even in, around with the other group <laughs> at first. No, i mean <laughs> yeah. so pick well, up well, and keep, well, oh, go well, ahead rick go ahead rick. Uh, no yeah, just and I don't want to take us too far off track, but th that story is, and it comes off of some stuff Steve's talked about, it, which I would not put put together without Steve having talked about it. So thanks, Steve. He went through that, and he was, you know, once you're converted, strengthen the brethren, right? That was the, the yeah. Lord's thing, because he knew that Satan had gone to sift Peter. But what was Peter's, Peter's first sermon was to the very people that had crucified his Lord. And where would you have been if you hadn't been through what Peter had been, right, in the sense of having rejected and denied Christ? And yet the Lord was right there to bring him back. Maybe where would your head have been giving that message to the people that had just crucified your Lord? But Peter, just having been through what he was through, 
could have compassion for them, bring the gospel, bring them where they needed to be. And there was a mighty revival and deliverance of all of those people. There's a restoration of people. And where and so so many of the things we go through, how, how many of those things does the Lord then turn around and just use us in the next situation we're in? Um, and we would never have been able to rightly divide that. We're talking about rightly dividing things, right? We would have never been able to rightly divide and bring that gospel, bring that that word without the, our own struggles having been through it. It's an amazing way the Lord set that, well, I'm not set it up. The way It's amazing how that transpired so that Peter, with his own personal experience, having wrestled down the gospel for himself, was then able to bring that to those you know, those thousands of people that came to know the Lord on that day. To me, I just think it's awesome how good God is to make, to just put that together in a perfect way and then see that redemption and deliverance Amen. and healing. And, and, no. and, and so pick up then, uh, Phil, I mean, from verse, where were we? 19, uh, 19, I think. Yeah. 19. Go ahead. Cause this is very much all, like what happened in the sermon you're talking about, Rick. So go ahead and read 19. Yeah. And all the people said unto Samuel, pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God, that we die not, for we have added unto all our sins this evil to ask us a king. And Samuel said unto the people, fear not, you have done all this wickedness, yet turn not aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. For the Lord will not forsake his people. Nope, for you his, missed a verse. Uh, excuse me, I apologize. Thank you. And turn ye not aside from for then should ye go after vain things, which cannot profit nor deliver, for they are vain. Stop. For the okay. Lord will not. Oh, yeah. Keep going. That's fine. Keep going. I'll let you for read the through Lord... to the end and then we'll go through it. I, I apologize, Phil. No problem. For the Lord <laughs> will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it hath pleased the Lord to make you his people. Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord and ceasing to pray for you. But I will teach you the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider how great things he hath done for you. But if ye shall still do wickedly, you shall be consumed, both ye and your king. All right. Now, I want to stop for a moment on verse 25. But if ye shall still do wickedly. Do you see, this was an element of repentance that they had to do. If they will still do wickedly, then ye shall be consumed, both ye and your king. All right. Now, were you somebody going to say something? I was just going to say, you know, that we go back to that scripture in Proverbs where, you know, confessing is the one part, but then there's forsaking is the other part. Forsake right. that way. Then you shall obtain mercy, right? right. So. So many people are fixated, and I've done wrong, I've done wrong. Okay, and I love what Samuel says here, right? Ye have done all this wickedness. I agree with you. You did do it. So now stop. <laughs> yeah, and then the other part here, and this is also very important, because, look, Christianity light is not Christianity. I mean, it is not Christianity. It says his, this is... Samuel says to all the children of Israel, he said that they have to serve the Lord with all their heart. I mean, not they're not adding Christ, they're not adding God to their life. He is their life. Okay. And I share this with folks out here because one of the most tragic elements and people don't realize how much it evidences unbelief in God, how much it evidences a lack of trust in God, how much it evidences a pride and haughtiness and high mindedness, how much it recognize it rejects the word of God. Right. And that is the fact that people struggle and don't preach nor believe that they have to love the Lord with all their heart mind, soul, and strength, as Jesus said, okay, in the New Testament, all right? That's all. That's not part or after this or, well, but because of this or, no, there's all, 100%, all. Now, the reason why I say it's such a strong evidence of unbelief and pride and every other thing is 
because what people are saying is that they know better than God. I mean, they're at, what you're actually saying is you know better than God or that he's not trustworthy <laughs> or any of these other kinds of things. All right. And I say this to you folks, because when you realize that's what you're doing, uh, maybe you will be inclined to repent of that because God can't honor unbelief. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. You have got to believe that God is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And that reward happens. It's not that there's not a reward in the great by and by, but he will reward you today. And then he will reward you Amen. tomorrow. And then he will reward you the next day. That doesn't mean you don't go through difficult times. It doesn't mean you may not be in battles that are take an extended period of time to emerge victorious doesn't mean that those kinds of things will not be true. But <clears throat> what it is, is that when you believe God and you know that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him, Jesus speaking to the woman at the well talked about how he would give her living waters that would spring up and she would not thirst again. Okay, And she thought it was talking about that I was going to get something that I didn't have to come back over to the well and fill it up and drink anymore. But what he's talking about is that that spirit that he then pours out upon you, that spirit will it'll bring you back up when you are down. When you think you're down for the count and out and there's nothing left, that spirit will once again give you a hope that transcends what you're experiencing right there. And God will move in ways in your most desperate hours that are... I mean, I can tell you, I think I can say this about all four of us. Would any of us be up on this program tonight if what I was saying is not true? I no. wouldn't be. I mean, absolutely not. I know I'd have quit and given up a hell of a long time ago. The only reason why any of us are even on here is because of that spirit re re springing up and renewing our hope in the midst of often desperate times, times often that are our own fault, we find ourselves in them. Because we weren't serving them with all our heart. And what did we do? We went after vain things. Yep. And then we got angry at them for it. How come these vain things aren't working out the way I think they ought to work out? Where are which you? Cannot, which <laughs> cannot profit nor deliver. Right. Now, let me ask you something, guys. Let's have a show of hands. Who has done this? Okay. Who's done this more than I can count on my two hands? Who has done it that more than I can, we can count on all our fingers and toes? I mean, you know, I mean, come on. I mean, praise God. Do you follow what I'm saying? I mean, just thank Roman God. Says, um, a multitude of sins. <laughs> yeah, it talks about yeah, that. A multitude. Yeah. <laughs> so I share this because, look, I mean, these things are serious. They are yeah. serious. And we need to take them, we need to give them the proper seriousness. Reference. Yeah, deference and cleave to them. Reference. So let's turn now. I want to turn over to something. So we've just seen in here how the children of Israel then, um, you know, Samuel brings them to account. And he says, I mean, and, and one thing, I, if you look at 23, I just want to hit on this one too. He says, moreover, as for me, okay, uh, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. This was a man who watched Israel. He watched Israel go from a horrific time where there was no open vision, where the high priest himself was being prophesied of his demise and his whole family's demise and how they were going to be ultimately cast out of the priesthood, which happened during the days of, uh, uh, was it Solomon or was it at the end of David? It was right in that period of time. I forget when it was. Um, but that they were going to be cast out of the priesthood, okay, which is extraordinary. right? This is a hereditary priesthood. Um, and they, uh, uh, he, had, he had watched these times in a time when Israel was at a low ebb. They'd even lost 
Was it during his time that they lost the Ark of the Covenant? Or was no? That's right. That's yeah. when it was. Yeah. He was a little boy when they lost the Ark of the Covenant to the Philistines. Right. And and the Israelites didn't go rescue the Ark of the Covenant. God brought the Ark of the Covenant back because that's how big he is. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, and the and the Philistines were so scared, they offered up offerings to God, put them in there of all the different plagues they'd been hit with for taking the Ark of the Covenant. Um, yep. And it came back to them. So I, I you know, I, I, I just want to show you, Samuel had seen a lot, and he was now an old man, but he did not cease to pray for Israel, notwithstanding their offense. And he did not cease from teaching them the right <laughs> way. And what happened is while he didn't see it come to pass in his lifetime, I can tell you Samuel's stand is what led to David and Nathan and Gad and led all and to relatively faithful time during David's kingdom and then to the high point of faith in, in Israel, which was under Solomon in the beginning. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was extraordinary. Um, certainly he actually... If you read if you read it from Samuel to Solomon, you can see how Solomon stands set up for David to be very victorious in in during that time. And then you see David doing all those fights and all those battles, set it up very easy for Solomon and the whole nation. Like he did the fighting up front, man. Solomon and during that time was a very smooth ride and you can kind of see their faith and their battles and their fight in the faith um, just carry on and, and just increasingly um, get better and you see the blessing of God continue from each step. It's kind of interesting to see. Yeah, now so and you saw the bearing fruit later, which is how it is. It always takes more faith to <clears throat> sow than it does to reap. You know, everybody wants to be there when the reapings come because then you get to eat. You don't get to eat when you're sowing. You got to put it down there and then wait. You sow in hope. All right. Now, I made a statement that a lot of people really are shocked at, that government exists because of man's rebellion to God. So let's take a look at how does God do things. So uh, can one of you guys turn to Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 to 17 for me? And this is Jesus. I got speaking. It. You got it, Rick? All right. Go yeah. ahead and read to so this, me. <clears throat> this is the 15 to 18, you said? 15, 17? Yep, 15 anyway. to 17. <clears throat> Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass, trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it to the, tell it under the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. Right. You're not going to have anything more to do with it. Yep. All right. So let's look at this. Moreover, if <clears throat> there's a somebody, hold on, there's a feedback. Yeah. Is that Scotty? Probably because he. Let's see. Is it still there? No, I think no, it was Scotty took his earbuds out. That's what it was, I think. Okay. All right. So watch. Moreover, if thy brother trespass, so is that just anybody in the community? Now, we're going to see in this, as I say, it, brother, it's talking about a Christian brother. That's what this is talking about. If thy Christian brother trespass against thee. What that highlights, which is the reason why we have civil government, is because, of course, not everybody's our Christian brother. Just a reality. Yeah, good point. Okay, it's just a reality. If the if this is if this is my neighbor who's a Muslim and stuff like that, really, I'm going to bring him before the church and say he's a heathen and this, that, and the other thing. I mean, like that's going to matter to him. You, you follow what I'm saying? It's uh, he doesn't believe in Christianity to begin with. He doesn't recognize any of what we're talking about. You follow what I'm saying? It does. This does not relate outside the church. But of course. God did not set man up originally so that, well, let me put it in God's kingdom. Let me put it to you this way. In God's kingdom, there is going to be, let's call it his heavenly kingdom. There is going to be no rebellion. 
We're going to have a free will. We're going to have a free will. But you know what? Yeah, well, the thing is, it, rebellion is not going to be tolerated at all. All right. right. We have grace here. Why? Because the man was made subject to vanity unwillingly. In other words, subject to vanity is we're subject to sin, folks. And all the darkness that that entails. And we didn't, I mean, I didn't do anything to want to want to receive this. I was just born. I was just born that way. A natural born sinner. Right? Just like you. That's who we all are. We're all natural born sinners. I mean, look, you don't have to, you don't start taking notes from your child when they come out the thing. They're the one, they're inconveniencing you and crying and messing up and all these things because they don't care about you, <laughs> except for what you could give to them. I mean, I love my children and everything, but they don't come out of the shoot all lovey and all these other things. They come out selfish and self-centered. That's why we have Amen. to train our children up in the way that they should go. If you don't do that, then don't be surprised when you don't like the way they go. Right. All right. But so moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. Who else needs to be involved? Does anybody even know to ha have to know that it even happened? No. Nope. Right, just between you and your brother. That's not how we do most it. Things, most, th most things can be solved that way among brothers. You know, and it's funny. I mean, as uh, you guys know, I'm an attorney. I mean, I'd, I'd always have these people, they come to me and they say, well, my neighbor's doing this and stuff like that. And I want you to call the government. Or I want you to do this. Or I want you to bring suit. I said, I'd say to him, I'd say, have you talked to your neighbor? Well, no. Don't you think that might be a good place to start? Good starting point. Before you start spending a bunch of money on me and like invoking hell and er everything else against him, you know, which is the way man is, he offended me. He, I don't like what he did. Down with him. Let me go destroy him. That was exactly how Christ oh. walked, right? That's what he did. He was walking and people said bad things. He said, poof, <laughs> next, you know, I mean, he walked around the street and everybody who rejected him, he just offed him right there, right? You know, it's kind of, in, no, that didn't. No, he didn't do that? Didn't. Okay, you're, you read no, the same fact, Bible it, I read. And then, and then, you know, you also even have our disciples, shall we call down fire and consume them? And he says, right. um, no, I didn't. That's not the reason you know, why no. I came. You know, yeah. what's yeah. that, Rick? Is it, you don't, you 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 don't know what spirit you're speaking from. You're, you're not coming yeah. from Yep. That's what he said. And if you think about just that point you're making, it's, I just kind of remember an incident where my neighbor, I was just riding a bike and the dog chased me and, and my daughter, you know, and, uh, you know, I just rolled up there and talked to him, and he's like, oh, I mean, I apologize. It usually doesn't happen. I'll make sure it doesn't happen again. I mean, it's just a simple thing, but it's amazing. We're people. We There's so many times that, man, I, I could be offending people. I don't even know it. Like, I don't even, you know what I mean? Like, I, um, you know, it's amazing how we, we're people. We're messy by nature. We just are. I mean, I don't know how to des describe it, but we we are. We don't even, it's not like. We have to try very hard to be messy. It just is a very natural thing that comes upon us <laughs> that we are messy and we cause issues. I'm, I'm not like without effort because, you know, we can cause a flow of issues. But it's amazing that um, you can just go talk to somebody and they might not have a clue of what they're doing and their actions that they're doing as how it's affecting you or, or somebody else. And it's amazing when they become aware of they're like, Oh, really? Oh my God. I apologize. I got to make sure I don't do that again. I didn't even realize, you know, it's amazing what that, how simple sometimes these solutions are. And the beauty is and, nobody and, else to need, <clears throat> nobody else needs to know about it either. Yeah. It's just between two people. What's the big deal? Nobody ever has to hear about what a stupid idiot you or me were. We just know it amongst ourselves and we can laugh about it, about ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. No. I was, and we can yeah. even laugh and tell our neighbor, our other neighbors, if we want to. You know what I'm saying? But it's it's just and, and a very different experience. It, it is, and the other thing it brings it back. It actually brings a closeness between you and that person. You actually Absolutely. become closer, and you get to better understand them and know them more, and they get to understand you and know you more. 
and, and it's an amazing um, what can happen out of that. So, All right, so that's simple. Okay, step one, if your brother offend, they trespass against it, go speak to your brother. Okay, if he doesn't but, hear you, which, I mean, it's been known to happen, just so you know, because just like Phil was saying, we're messy. Sometimes we can be stubborn and uh, blind and uh, prideful and arrogant and a bunch of other things, right? I mean, has that ever happened amongst us guys? Have we ever been that way? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, um, I mean, I know, I mean, look, Phil, I mean, I know sometimes you haven't said the kindest things to me to my face. I mean, I've, I thought I've just been a heck of a nice guy, but sometimes Phil didn't think that's what I was doing. I don't know why, but uh, it did happen a couple of times. <laughs> uh, and uh, <laughs> so here it says, but if he will not hear thee, then what are we supposed to do? What Go do we do if church. he won't hear us? No. no. Get some friends. Don't you do it? It's like it's one, two, three, three, three. three. Right. <laughs> three. See, this is the problem, folks. My brother, just be quiet. Brother, you offend me. Guys, I got two oh, witnesses gosh. here, man. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I'm having fun with you, bro. But yeah, I mean, so what do you do? You bring one or two others with you. What? Because now you want the thing to be established, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. So it's not like, Oh, you said this. No, he, you said that. No, look, we're going to establish what's being said here. All right. right. We're bringing some witnesses. Everybody's going to know what you said. Everybody's going to know what I said. All right. That's the end of it. Okay. We're not going to be able to worm our way around what was said. All right. Uh, so you go. And you know what? It says, and if he shall neglect to hear them. So now, okay, that didn't do it. You got step three. Tell it unto the church. All right. Well, now, like, we're all part of the same fellowship. Okay, so I go to you individually, and that doesn't do it. I bring a couple others with me. That doesn't do it. Now I bring you before the church. All right. Well, if you're part of a church and you like being a part of that church and want to be a part of that church and believe that God is with the people in that church, well, this is a pretty big deal then. If it's gotten that far, indeed, it should have been resolved with the talking to your brother. <laughs> and so if it doesn't and the person doesn't hear, but if you neglect to hear the church, let them be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. Now, let me give you guys an example. You guys know this story a little bit. Years ago, during one of our first ministers conferences out in Texas, I get an email from a guy, a Puerto Rican guy. He was a minister in New York City. And his uh, he was part of a big church that was down on Wall Street. It was run by a guy, I think, from Trinidad. Um, and he had a radio show in New York City as well. I mean, he was pretty big time, um, uh, certainly in the sense of, um, you know, worldly things. He was way bigger time than any of us. I mean, we, we he wouldn't even notice. We'd be like a, a pebble on the corner of the street that he wouldn't even pay any attention to. Um, so this guy comes to me because what had happened is, at least his story, okay, this was his story. His story was that this other minister, there was a woman, she was called the chief usher, and she was the chief usher basically because she gave money and bought them suits and stuff like that, which is a whole nother thing, which is just wrong. But that's what people do. They put the people who have money into positions and call them some title and everything so that they keep them. So this uh, woman had been interested in the guy who contacted me. And he was married. He wasn't going to do something like that. And so he said, no. And so she then went and told the head minister that he had tried, it was the opposite, the other way around, okay, that he was trying to have a relationship with her. And uh, he told me, I, you know, I've got this lawsuit and I'm writing to you because I need a Christian lawyer. And uh, I said to him, and this is going to go to the next verses we'll be here with. I said to him, I said, well, I said, you need to withdraw your lawsuit. And he's like, what? 
He's countersued me. He wants to, he's claiming I've taken away his members. He wants like hundreds of thousands of dollars. He wants to take away my house. I said, well, you got to, I said, you've done wrong. You've got to take away your, you got to pull your, pull your, um, pull your lawsuit. And he's like, I figured I would never hear from the guy again. Okay. So he, he, uh, I, I wrote this thing to him and he, calls me and we had a couple conversations and he was represented by a lawyer and there was a case pending in New York City and I happened to be an attorney in New York so I could have represented him um, but I told him what I wrote him when I wrote him is I wrote him the next passage go to 1 Corinthians 6 uh, and Scott I'm going to have you read this one if you can get over there All right. so I want you to read from verse 6 1 to 8 so uh, all righty we will get there <laughs> well scotty may get there so i i scotty's about ready to read this what i did is when he wrote me i wrote this thing and i said you did wrong you need to withdraw your lawsuit and i quoted to him first corinthians chapter 6 verses 1 to 8 um, and that right. was my dare email response any of you dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints, be not known that the saints shall judge the world, and if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know you not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are the least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. But brother goeth to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Now, therefore, there is utterly a fault among you, because you go to law one with another. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, you do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren. So this is the passage I wrote to him. And so this guy, I figured I'm done. Well, that was easy. Uh, and I was going on, and he called me. And what had happened is, the little bit fuller story is, the woman had made this accusation. He was brought before the head minister, and the minister immediately kicked him out of the church. Okay, the woman never came to him. Okay, the minister never came, no two or three. He was just immediately kicked out of the church. And apparently there was a jealousy thing. The people kind of liked this other guy better than the head minister from what I understood. And so I told him, you have to withdraw. And he said, but he's got a countersuit against me. He's gonna take my house. I said, do you want God to judge this matter or do you want that judge to judge this matter? And he goes, well, I want God to judge this matter. I said, then withdraw your lawsuit. And he goes and he talks to his attorney and he tells his attorney that, you know, I have advised him to withdraw his lawsuit. The attorney goes, I won't do that for you. That's ridiculous. You should not do that. It's literally what the attorney said. He said, I won't do it for you. That's ridiculous. I said, I said, all right. Um, I said, you need to withdraw your lawsuit. But he's, my attorney says he's going to take my house because he's got this multi hundred thousand dollar counterclaim against me and everything. I said, well, I said, do you want God to judge this matter? You want that uh, you want that judge to judge the matter? He says, well, I want God to judge the matter. He said, well, my uh, he said, my attorney says that if he won't withdraw the law, his lawsuit simultaneously, it makes no sense. For me to do it i said all right okay so I, I could tell he was he was a little bit scared about this which i understand i might have been scared if i were in his shoes too so don't get me wrong so i said to him i said look do this then write your brother a letter the fellow minister write to him and say hey look man i apologize i have done wrong in bringing you into court before the unbeliever and quote the scripture that I've shared and say, look, I am going to withdraw my lawsuit with prejudice, which means I can never bring it back against you. 
All right, I am going to withdraw my lawsuit with prejudice if I do not hear from you in the next 30 days. But if I do, and you would like to withdraw yours as well, and we can meet and talk about this, um, my attorney tells me it would be very easy matter for us to do that if you would likewise be in agreement. So he writes this letter, and I kind of reviewed it, made sure it was okay, and he sends it out. And uh, you know, one week goes by, no answer. Two weeks go by, no answer. Three weeks go by, no answer. Now we're past 30 days. And so he calls me, what do I do? I said, well, you withdraw your lawsuit. That's what you said you were going to do. He said, but he's going to take my house from me. I said, well, do you want God to judge this matter? <laughs> or do you want that judge to judge this matter? I mean, literally, yeah. this was the conversation. <laughs> and I, he goes, I needed that too. <laughs> and he goes, uh, he goes, well, I want God to judge it. He said, then you need to withdraw it. He said, well, my, my client, my attorney won't do it. I said, well, then this is what you do. I said, write to the judge, say, I'm and." I told him a few things. I said, and attach the letter you sent to the other guy and say, look, I'm withdrawing my lawsuit with prejudice for these reasons, Your Honor. And just give him a copy of your letter. So what happens is the court calls a hearing to talk about getting ready for trial. And he goes in. Now his attorney's dropped out, okay, because he won't represent him anymore. So he's going before the judge, and the other guy's got his attorney, and he's going there and he goes in and he goes, the judge goes, hey, guy, he goes, so you guys are dropping this lawsuit? And the attorney on the other side goes, absolutely not. He's stolen our congregant, uh, you know, members of our congregation, which was actually not true. The guy didn't even have a church. He wasn't meeting anybody. He was so scared to say anything. He was literally not talking to anybody. Okay, um, But they were still accusing him of this. And I and he comes back and the judge goes, well, I thought from this that you guys were dropping. And he turns to my guy and he goes, you need an attorney. He said to him, he said, you need an attorney. So the guy comes back and I, I said, to, he calls me up and he goes, what are you, what are you going to do? And I said, um, uh, I said, I said, what are, you, what are you talking about? He said, will you represent me? I said, you're withdrawing your lawsuit. You don't need an attorney. Because, and I said, let me ask you something. If the judge had decided that matter today, who do you think would have won? He said, I actually believe I would win. I said, you're probably right. I said, and the fact of the matter is, look at the Apostle Paul. They hired orders against the Apostle Paul. Did that defeat Paul? No. I said, now, Watch, if I enter into this match, it's going to change the dynamic completely. Okay, it's going to change the dynamic correct completely. Do you want God to judge us or do you want the judge to judge us? He said, I want the judge to judge. I mean, I want the Lord to judge it. He came over and stayed with us for a night, he and his wife and his son. And he was scared. Goes back. And what happened is uh, he then comes up and they had another pre-trial hearing. And again, the judge says he has to get an attorney. I said, no. So just go tell him what happened and what the scoop is. You'll be fine. Do you want God to judge this matter? Or you want that judge to judge? You want God to judge this matter? He then calls mm -hmm. me and he goes, Steve, you got to listen to this guy. He's going up on his radio program on New York City. And he's talking <laughs> about, he's talking about me. And he's saying, he's saying, look, He's so scared. He knows he's done wrong. He's withdrawn his lawsuit. We're going to, the Lord's going to show up. He's going to take it and we're going to prevail. And you know what? He told me that. And he, and he said, I said, don't worry about it. He's like, Steve, don't you? You know, he's like, just beside himself. Okay. I said, do you want God to judge this matter? You want, he said, I want God to judge this matter. And then what happened about a week later, he calls me and he goes, he said he was struck. He cannot speak. He's in the hospital. He's dying. What do I do? I said, well, send word to him that you'd like to come see him. And so he sent word to the guy through people that they knew that he wanted to come see him. And the guy wouldn't see him. And he died like a week later. And after the guy died, what happened is the... Um, 
they held another time. What's going on with this lawsuit? And his attor the attorney on the other side showed up and he said, we're withdrawing everything. And the case was gone. All right, and God had judged that matter. See, folks, the thing I want you to understand is that the Lord is real. He is real. All right, people can masquerade and do all these things. God knows exactly what's going on. He is not deceived by what's going on. In that whole action, my guy all he wanted to do was be to talk with the guy because it wasn't true. And it was just like what had happened is the guy was trying to then go up the chain in the ministry. And he was part of a large televangelist ministry. Let me just put it to you that way. I won't identify these people, but he was part of a large televangelist ministry. And I contacted that televangelist ministry and I told him about the dispute. And I said, look, this is ridiculous that this is going on in a court in New York City. You guys need to get in and take care of it. And they said, oh, we don't get involved in these things. That was, I mean, this is a guy, millions of people, lots of money, probably private planes, all that stuff. Um, very popular evangelical preacher back in the 90s and 2000s. I don't know if he still is. I haven't looked, but he wouldn't get involved in this. That's the state of the church today, folks. But God is real and God will judge. And that's why these things work. When anything about me, the guy said, he told me what had happened. He said he wanted God to judge the matter. God judged the matter. The guy had an opportunity to be healed and delivered and not have to die. But he refused to see my guy. Amen. You know, this was none of this was to the designed to be to the harm to anybody. Yeah, all of this you're talking about here and all that the Lord put forth both in Matthew and over here in Corinthians, that there would be a reconciliation. Right. N not not some sort of fire from heaven. Right. But rather, I mean, Jesus came to reconcile mankind unto himself, unto the Father. OK, we'll say that. Right, so that we could be reconciled, not destroyed. It's clear, and this is something I preached about today. It's something that's been heavy on my heart for a while now, and the Lord's really working some things out because I was, I would have been the first guy. Okay, um, I would have been the first guy, but Jesus came to save the world because it's condemned already. It doesn't need more condemnation and judgment it needs salvation and redemption and that's what that's our our job is to bring that to the table and what you're talking about here is coming at the situation for, with a desire with an expectation of reconciliation not further confrontation you know and 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 the thing and, is uh, go ahead, is that ultimately then what happens is the lord moved I don't know what to say. I mean, look, I don't have authority. I don't, I didn't call anything down on this guy. I didn't call anything. I just said, do you want the Lord to judge it? Or do you want this judge over here to judge it? He kept saying he wanted the Lord to judge it. Well, you know what? People don't fear the Lord. They don't believe things like I just described that they happen anymore. I have seen things like this happen. I've seen extraordinary things happen, both extraordinarily good Okay, where, I mean, I'm weeping with joy and crying at how extraordinary God has moved. And I've seen things happen th that are exceptionally grievous. I have seen both. All right. Uh, I've seen people be delivered of situations like this in extraordinary manners that every attorney I knew were like, what happened? And I'm like, yeah, this is what happened. And, you know... It's the Lord dwells amongst and in his people. And if we will do things his way, he will manifest that he is with us. But if we won't, 
he won't. I mean, it's really not that complicated, folks. No. And over here, one of the things I want you to understand in this chapter six of First Corinthians is, you know, it says here, now, therefore, there is utterly a fault among you because you go to law one with another. This is verse seven. Why do you not rather take wrong? It's amazing how people don't ever imagine doing that anymore. They just think the wrong. You know, I mean, it's, it's amazing. They, the idea of taking a wrong. I mean, did Stephen take a wrong when he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do? Amen. Did Jesus take a wrong when he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do? Amen. You, you follow what I'm saying? I mean, uh, well, go ahead, you know, Phil. I, I... I even look at it like this. I mean, remember how you were talking about, you know, your child and you'll have, you know, grace upon your child as they grow and learn. It takes some time to learn these things. You know, when I look at why do you not rather take wrong? There's certain times where you're going to have people that accept the Lord and or people you're ministering to or, you know, people outside that, you know, you, you might take some wrong from them and 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 never bring it up because they can't hear. They're not at a place to be able to hear that. It just throw weights on them and condemn them and 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 and, and drag them down, not lift them up. Every there's time, every time of, you go, every time you go different. to every time you go to the store, every time you go to work, every time you go out. I mean, this is basically. I mean, the idea is everybody's doing wrong. Our whole job is to bring that love and forgiveness into these situations somehow. Yeah. And your point, Phil, is a really good point. And it's a aspect of love. Um, and it's and and one of the reasons why we can is that because we may have been defrauded, we might have had something taken, we may have lost something. But it is the Lord who is our supplier. It's not a zero sum game just because something was taken from me. If I need it, it's not like I can never have something like that again. If I need it, I can. I mean, the Lord will give me what I need to do it. I mean, because he wants us to be able to do what he wants us to do end of story. Uh, so you don't have to be hung up about it. Um, and the person is far and, more valuable than whatever thing you've lost. I mean, Joseph took wrong okay. as the brother's reconciliation. Jesus Christ suffered the cross for our reconciliation. You know, um, what's, what's important, you know, this life is but a vapor. Absolutely. Yep. <clears throat> All right, guys, we've actually slightly crossed over our oh, wow. hour thing, so go figure. So, Rick, I hit the end stream on the on the yacht, you who, yacht, yacht, YouTube first, correct? Uh, that is correct. When you are done, when you're okay. ready to call it a day, yep, hit the end stream. We all say, well, we all say goodbye, yep. and then uh, when the buffer's done, hit it, end it. You can see that as, as Rick's describing this to me, you guys would think after eight, this being my eighth program, that I would be doing these things like second nature. Obviously, that's not yet true. So most anybody can do something. It's, a, it's an astonishment here. So praise God. And we'll pick up because I want to talk about government and civil government and how we deal with that. We'll probably pick up on that next week. But I did want you to see that the way God has things set up is different. But that today because we're not yet in his heavenly kingdom the only kingdom where he has jurisdiction that way if you will where he his rule is established is in the body of jesus christ which is the church I mean, the ruler of this world is the devil uh and you see his people dwelling in and amongst believing, unbelieving, all sorts of folks. And he tells us how to operate in every situation um, and how we can then serve him and how he will be with us. And there's multitudes of examples in the scriptures. So we're going to get into that a little bit next week. So for now, we're going to say goodbye, guys. Say sayonara, sign off, whatever you want to say. Good night there. Good night, everybody. And may the Lord bless you guys. We'll see you next week.
Okay. 